Good afternoon and welcome to the fifth presentation in our Wisconsin Citizen Lake Monitoring Network Spring Webinar Series. This is Paul Skowinski. I'm the statewide educator for the network and today I get to be the host and one of the presenters. A couple of the usual reminders before we begin today. All of our webinars are recorded for later viewing, so you'll be able to find a recording of today's webinar on our Extension Lakes YouTube channel. You can see it on the screen there, UWEX Lakes is what you'll need to search for. I'll also send out a link to the recording later today, um, so you won't have to worry about searching for that on YouTube. You'll get a direct link to the video. Um, feel free to share that recording further if you know of others that would be interested in the information presented today. Please put all of your questions into the chat box today as uh, we'll take all the questions at the end. Sarah and Amy from our team at Extension Lakes are here to help out with facilitating the Q&A session at the end. Uh, we do expect this webinar may go a little bit over the usual one hour time period since we have a large audience today. I see 158 in the room so far. Uh, there were over 300 registered, so we'll see how big the group gets today. Uh, we've also received a lot of questions via email already, so we expect there will be a lot of questions at the end. If you do need to leave at 1 o'clock, remember that the entire webinar is being recorded, so you can catch anything that you missed by watching the recording. Another reminder, we do have one more webinar remaining in our CLMN webinar series this spring, which is next Wednesday, the 13th at noon with Forrest Jonke from the Crawford Stewardship Project. He'll be talking about the interesting karst landscape features common in Southwest Wisconsin and some other parts of the state and the implications of those features for water resources. We hope you can join us again for that webinar next week. Okay, so today's webinar will be, uh, and we'll have two presentations. I will start things off with a focus on rain gardens and their role in protecting water quality and then I'll turn it over to my colleague Patrick Goggin for a second presentation on gardens closer to the water's edge and he'll share some other helpful tips and resources with you. And as I said before, Patrick and I are both willing to stick around past one o'clock to answer questions if they're still coming in. So before I start us off today, a little about me. In addition to coordinating the Wisconsin Citizen Lake Monitoring Network, I also teach aquatic plant taxonomy here at UW-Stevens Point, and I'm the president of the Central Wisconsin Wild Ones chapter. Wild Ones is a national organization uh, and has chapters in many states across the country, and the organization focuses on promoting the use of native vegetation in landscaping practices. I particularly enjoy kayak fishing and spending time studying plants and animals that are in the water and gardening with native plants, especially using them to attract butterflies. This is my daughter who proudly identifies herself as a butterfly scientist. She and I raised and released over 170 monarch butterflies last year and we volunteer for multiple monarch related citizen science programs. Our rain garden here and other gardens here at home are primarily designed with butterflies in mind. Uh, you can see that she, she even gets involved with looking at the health of the butterflies under a compound microscope before we release any. Uh, so this is a lot of fun and, and you'll hear me talking a little bit more about butterflies later on today. So let's get started here with the Shoreline Gardening for Healthy Lakes and Rivers webinar part one on rain gardens. So this slide here shows a, uh, a landscape before and after human development, uh, typical conditions that you would see before and after. On the before shot on the left, what you see is the there's a lot of uh, variation in the topography of the land. So there are high spots and there are low spots and there's a lot of vegetation covering the land. So when heavy precipitation falls out of the sky, a lot of the energy of that precipitation is absorbed by the vegetation before it hits the ground. And that decreases the amount of erosion potential of those large raindrops hitting the ground. Uh, also important is those low spots in the landscape. So when the water does hit the ground, if it's, if it's falling at a high rate, then uh, some of the water is likely to start moving across the land instead of just soaking in. And those low spots allow places for the water to pool and concentrate, slow down across the landscape and then soak into the ground over a short period of time. Um, on the, the right side, after development, what we typically see is a very flattened landscape that is compacted. Uh, that happens during the construction process. A lot of lawns are very compacted. Some topsoil might be brought in and then uh, turf is established on top of that. So we have poor infiltration 
around our homes and certainly across hardscapes like roads and driveways and sidewalks. So a lot of the water that falls on the landscape tends to flow across the land instead of going down into the water table. In addition, we don't have a lot of vegetation on the landscape. It's uh, in these developed areas. It's a lot of lawn grasses, which are not very good at slowing down water. They often lay down uh, when there's water flowing across the land, so it actually accelerates the flow of water across the landscape. That water is then carrying other things with it as well as it runs across the landscape. It's picking up pollutants. Uh, it could be fertilizers and pesticides off of the land. It could be things like motor oil and brake dust or uh, compounds off of a, a roof or um, all kinds of other sources. So all that flow then is concentrated across the land and gets down to a low spot, which is our beautiful lakes and streams here. Uh, and we're receiving a lot of that pollution through that water uh, over from surface runoff instead of through groundwater. So what, we'd re what we would prefer to see is that that water slowly infiltrates into the ground and is filtered and then slowly conveyed through the groundwater system into our lakes and streams instead of being fed by that surface water runoff. So pollution comes from a lot of different sources as I've already touched on a little bit and those those pollutants tend to accumulate at the low spots, which are our lakes and streams. These chemicals tend to move pretty freely across the soil. Uh, many of them are, are not good at binding to soil either, so they can move fairly freely to the lake, unless there's a, bar a barrier of deep rooted vegetation in the way that can help slow that flow down and accumulate some of those pollutants. The US Environmental Protection Agency did a study on water pollution and found that about 70% of water pollution in the nation is caused by stormwater runoff carrying those pollutants to our waterways. They also looked at rain gardens and found that up to 90% of pollutants and nutrients in that stormwater can be effectively removed by a simple rain garden. So uh, an important practice as homeowners and people who, who live around lakes and enjoy lakes is to try to capture your own stormwater. So instead of sending your pollutants that are produced on your site downstream to somebody else to cause a problem somewhere else, uh, it's, it's really in the interest of the community as a whole to try to capture your own stormwater and do your part to keep your lake or your river or your watershed healthy and clean. So uh, a brief Illustration here of rain gardens, uh, just to give you an, a general idea and description of what a rain garden is. It's a low area that could be a natural low spot in the landscape, or it could be a man made uh, low spot somewhere that's just simply dug out wherever you'd, you'd like it to be. And this allows water to be captured and slow down so that it can soak in over a short period of time. It decreases erosion as that water does not run over the landscape anymore. It stays in one spot and settles uh, into the ground. It decreases the pollution in the stormwater and also the volume of stormwater. And it increases water quality downstream by doing the things already mentioned here, uh, removing sediments from the water by decreasing erosion. The water doesn't pick up a lot of pollutants and carry it downstream. As all these things are filtered out through the rain gardens, the, the water that does reach the streams and lakes is of better quality. Rain gardens should be located away from structures. Generally, the recommendation is at least 10 feet away. And at the bottom end of the rain garden, the down slope end, uh, there should be an outlet on that side. Just in case your, your rain garden does fill up all the way during a heavy storm event, you don't want your water to be overflowing in the direction of a structure. You'd want it to be uh, overflowing away from the house or away from the building. And these areas are filled with native plants to encourage infiltration and absorption of any pollutants that are in that water. So before we go any further with that, what is a native plant? Uh, in, in my perspective, uh, when I talk about native plants, I'm referring to things that are naturally growing at the state levels. So uh, a native plant here would be something that naturally grows in Wisconsin that was here before human colonization of Wisconsin in 1848. Um, so three examples here are the cardinal flower on the left, a beautiful red flower that's typically found in floodplains and other moist areas in part shade. The uh, spiderwort, the blue spiderwort or Ohio spiderwort in the center. 
And of course, on the right, one that most people recognize, the Rudbeckia, one of our Rudbeckia species, the common black-eyed Susan. In the background, there is a lance leaf coreopsis, another common uh, upland flower that is native here. And here's some other ones that are really nice candidates for rain gardens. We have the uh, New England aster in the upper left that is common in uh, a wide variety of habitats, but uh, typically in, in drainage ditches along the roads and other moist areas. You'll commonly see it in October. It's one of the last things you'll see flowering. On the bottom left is bottle gentian, a fantastic blue flower uh, that often grows in floodplains and along shorelines. The upper uh, center is Joe Pieweed. It's a, a pretty magnificent large plant. It gets up to about six feet tall with a very large cluster of flowers that could be 10 or 12 inches across. Um, on the bottom center is a blue flag iris. And on the right is a Bebs sedge, which is a fairly short clump forming sedge that is common in wetland areas. So uh, when planting a rain garden or any other garden, you need plants to start with. Should you use plugs or should you use seeds? Uh, in general, I recommend plugs whenever possible, but in the case of a rain garden, I would always recommend plugs. Uh, rain gardens concentrate water, and there's a lot of water moving and uh, flow into the rain garden. And so if you put seed down, it's very likely that a lot of your seed will get washed around and, and concentrated in different areas. So it's really not a, a great option for a rain garden. You really want to use plugs or small potted plants to start the rain garden. So um, native plants can produce many different goals in terms of a garden. In this case, this is a, a garden that was designed to provide a, a wall of late season flowers for, um, for butterflies and for other late season pollinators. And also on the backside of this wall of pollinators is a house and a, an RV of the neighbors. So it was designed to screen the view of the neighbor's house and RV while also providing a, a very pretty backdrop for the backyard at this property. They provide a lot of wildlife value as well. This is an example of one of our native butterfly species on a purple coneflower. And they provide a lot of water quality improvements. In this particular slide, you can see there's a uh, lawn that slopes pretty heavily down from the right side. It accumulates down, uh, accumulates water down at the bottom and eventually runs into the storm drain. In almost all cases, storm drains do not provide any filtration or purification of storm water. It's simply a way to very quickly get water out of a certain place and direct it as quickly as possible to a local water body. Uh, sometimes there is a, a combined storm, so, storm water system and sanitary sewer system like in Milwaukee um, that occasionally does happen and so there is some treatment that sometimes happens but it also causes problems where raw sewage has to be dumped out into Lake Michigan occasionally during heavy storms because that mixed storm water and sanitary su uh, sewer flow are combined and the storm water overwhelms the system and then a lot of that water has to be discharged. So um, by capturing a lot of this water and decreasing flows into storm water systems, we can decrease the risk that, that raw sewage has to be discharged into a local water body. Here's another example. You can see a couple of, of uh, fertilized lawns sloping down to the water and uh, you can also see that the lake is being fertilized just as well as the landscape is in this case. There is really a lack of any vegetation along the shoreline and there's a lack of any low spots where that water would be soaking in. Uh, you also see right at the fringe of the lake where it meets the land is a bright green area that's duckweed, which is a, a native group of tiny floating plants. The duckweeds are not harmful in themselves, but they uh, do indicate often a nutrient loading source right there. So it's not surprising to see a concentration of duckweed right there where the water is meeting the fertilized lawn. You can also see in the foreground here next to my kayak is uh, a lot of filamentous algae that often grow in abundance again when there's nutrient loading issues in the in the near uh, area. So what you're really seeing is columns of these filamentous algae that were growing over aquatic plants and eventually smothered out those plants. They blocked all the sunlight from reaching those plants. 
so the plants died and left behind this column of of algae filaments behind um, not a very pleasant lake to fish in that's why i was at that particular lake i used to fish in a lot and catch a lot of fish but then uh, years later i went back and it looked like this and you couldn't really make a cast into that lake because there was just so much algae that would follow your lure every time you made a cast so um, not an enjoyable trip for me that time here's another example uh, another lawn that's being mowed down to the edge probably string trimmed all the way to the water or in the water uh, the bank is starting to slough into the water a little bit from erosion of the soil underneath the grass. And um, what you see up on the shoreline is a goose fence, which uh, really the problem is that there is no vegetation to deter the geese. But when you remove all the other vegetation, you've got these nice open lawns that geese love to feed on. And they have a wide open view for predators in any direction. So they really gather at those kinds of places. and. Uh, the goose fence usually doesn't help a whole lot. They just kind of jump or, or take a short flight over the fence and continue on their way. Uh, but again, you can see how well the lake itself is being fertilized in addition to the, the land here by the soil that's eroding in and carrying phosphorus into the lake itself. Here's an example from an aquatic plant survey. This is up in the northwest part of the state where uh, it was really an unpleasant plant survey day out there because we had to remove all this stringy algae off of the plants before we could identify what kind of plants we were seeing in the lake. So we don't like to see that. Um, getting back to the a rain garden construction, sometimes I get a question about whether trees and shrubs can be incorporated into a rain garden. And the answer is they really uh, don't belong well in the in the middle of a rain garden or in the in the design itself, but around the perimeter of a rain garden, there's really nothing wrong with having some shrubs or small trees. And the trees have very large root systems. And again, same thing with shrubs. Typically the biomass of the plant underneath the ground is about as, as much as there is above ground. So they do have large root systems and they are very effective at re removing a lot of water and a lot of pollutants. So they can be effective ways to manage stormwater on the periphery of a rain garden, but uh, they're best left out of the actual rain garden design itself. This is a plot showing root systems of typical prairie plants. So many of them are commonly used in rain garden designs. And what you can see here is that many of these root systems go down many, many feet, five feet, eight feet, up to 15 feet in the case of a few of these. So these plants need very little maintenance on our part. They don't need watering. They don't need fertilizing. They can take care of themselves in good times and the bad. Um, so they're very resilient plants and they're, they're easy to take care of. So that's one of the major reasons for recommending a lot of these native plants is that they don't take a lot of maintenance need. The one on the left there is Kentucky bluegrass, one of our common turf grass species. And you can see on the scale there that the root system is less than half a foot. It's often just a few inches deep, which is why Kentucky bluegrass requires a lot of maintenance on our part. If you want your lawn to look really nice and really thrive, it requires a lot of maintenance as far as irrigation and fertilizing and things like that. Kentucky bluegrass is not a native species here. It's not native to Kentucky either, ironically. Uh, it's native to very cool, moist areas of the world where uh, it doesn't, it's, it's basically like Wisconsin spring and fall year round. So it grows there because that's the kind of conditions that it prefers. In Wisconsin here, we see Kentucky bluegrass and a lot of other long grasses going dormant in July and August because that's really not the conditions that they're, they're developed to, to deal with. So they go dormant to avoid a period of, uh, of weather or climate that they do not like very much. And then they come back in the fall when the weather conditions are more appropriate for a growth. So let's get on to making a rain garden. So in this case, we're gonna pretend we have a, a typical urban situation here where the land is fairly flat and uniform and covered in turf. So we're gonna take some of our grass out and we're gonna make a rain garden instead. 
So the first thing we do is excavate a depression in the landscape, remove some of that turf, we excavate some of the soil underneath. That soil can be removed and taken somewhere else, or you could use it to create a berm around the rain garden to increase the depth of the rain garden. Or if you have a slope to your land, you could take some of that soil and build it up on the downslope side so that it evens out the rain garden slope a little bit. Um, for this purpose, we're just gonna pretend that we sent it off somewhere else and we've got this hole in the ground now to work with. So we're gonna add a little bit of compost to the bottom so that we can enrich the soil. If you already have very rich soil, you probably don't need to do this. But in cases like my house here, we're in very, very sandy soil. And it's always nice to have a little bit of compost mixed into a new garden bed, just to give your plants that much more edge uh, to, to thrive. They need a little bit of extra help with moisture retention and um, it just makes a really nice planting medium to put new plants into. So we're gonna mix that compost in, dig it up a little bit, till it up just a little bit with a shovel or a rake and just mix it in a little bit so we create a nice planting bed for our new plants. And then we're gonna add our plants in. Um, what you see here in the photo, we've got three different things represented. The sweet black-eyed Susan is uh, what you see on the left and the right on the, the edges of the rain garden. That's a fairly dry soil species. One really important thing to remember about a rain garden is that it is not a pond and it is not wet all the time. It will probably be wet for less than an hour in most cases after a decent rainstorm. So the plants that you put on the edges need to be adapted to dry sites. These are not wetland plants that are put on the edge of a, a rain garden. The plants in the bottom can will have more moisture available to them for longer periods of time. So you can get away with putting things like blue flag iris, bottle brush sedge, cardinal flowers, bottle gentians, other more wet species at the bottom because it does tend to stay in somewhat of a, a moist soil uh, condition down there at the bottom. The other thing represented in this illustration is just some sort of grass or sedge. It's, it's, uh, there's a wide variety of grasses and sedges that work out fine for rain gardens in the bottom and along the edges. So I just sort of threw a, a generic illustration of a, a grass or a sedge there. Uh, relating to the ponding idea, one of the other common misconceptions about rain gardens is that they breed mosquitoes because they're designed to trap water. And that is horribly untrue. Most mosquito species need uh, at least seven days of standing water in order to complete their life cycle underwater. A mosquito is an aquatic organism for the first week of its life or more, depending on the species. And in order for it to hatch out as an adult and become any kind of a pest, it first needs to have at least a week of standing water. And rain gardens do not provide a week of standing water. Even in very heavy soils, you're likely that uh, likely to see that water gone in within a day or two. In my area here, my rain garden is about 280 square feet and 14 inches deep in the middle, and it can fill up all the way and be completely drained after the storm within 20 minutes. So it does not take very long at all. Certainly not enough time for a mosquito to be completing a life cycle. Probably not even long enough for a mosquito to even find that water to lay eggs in. Um, the last thing I'll mention here is the border. I like to use field stones around um, around rain gardens. I think it provides a nice natural appearance for rain gardens. And in central Wisconsin here, there's a lot of farms where they constantly have to pick rocks out of the field and they have these big rock piles and they can't wait to get rid of them. So it's an easy source of a free rock material to put around the rain garden. The last thing to point out here is so you need some way to get the water to the rain garden. If you have a natural slope on the land and it's a natural low spot where water naturally collects, then that's a plus. It's an easy way to get water down there. If you don't have that, then you need to bring the water to the rain garden somehow. You don't want to have it right up against the side of the house where water just drips off the roof directly onto it because it's not good to encourage that much infiltration right next to your foundation. But in my case, I like to use downspout extensions. Uh, if they're fairly close to the house, you just put a simple extension on the downspout, get it out to the rain garden, and then put in a small pad of rocks to absorb the energy from the flow of that water coming out of the downspout so it doesn't erode the bottom of your rain garden out. Then you have your water coming out, and eventually it's going to uh, distribute itself across the rain garden, provided there's enough flow. If it's a light rain, all of your rain will probably soak in right next to the rock pad and you won't even notice there's any rain in the, in the rain garden. Um, it's designed to catch 
water from a larger storm. And in my case, with our rain garden here, we need about an inch and a quarter of rain in less than a half an hour's time in order to get it all the way up to the top. So most rainstorms we see do not fill the rain garden all the way. And then you can put some final touches in if you have any garden art or other things that you want to put in there. We have a toad house in our rain garden, so occasionally we'll see a toad in there. And uh, you can see him right there. So uh, one of the things that I tell people whenever I'm helping them design any new garden, whether it's a rain garden or not, is focus on your desires, what you're looking for from that garden. And this may be many things. It may not just be one. It could be that you're looking at attracting a certain kind of wildlife. In our case, we were really attracting, trying to attract as many butterflies as possible. But it could be that your focus is birds. It could be that you're trying to screen your kid's playset from the road, or it could be you're screening an unsightly view from the neighbor's yard. Um, could be many things. So try to accomplish as many of those things at one time if you can. In our case, we were trying to screen our front porch a little bit from the road. We were trying to provide a butterfly paradise in our front yard, and we were trying to provide a, a butterfly viewing area from our front porch as well. So you can see the corner of our, our sidewalk there right in front of the front step. Uh, it's very close to our front porch so we can sit on the porch and we can watch all the butterflies fluttering around in our front yard um, and also be screened a little bit from the road too. So it's kind of a private area with um, just a place to go out and enjoy the wildlife in the front yard. Um, again, this is about 280 square feet. It's about 14 inches deep in the middle, and it's a, it drains about 1,100 square feet. So that's half the house plus the garage that drains through one downspout on the front of the house all to this rain garden. So it gets a lot of water. It gets some pretty heavy flow. Uh, this is a picture from August 1st, the day that we had marked the area. You can see there's a landscaping truck in the road. I did hire a landscaper to help me for a few hours with this because a lot of soil had to be excavated out of the rain garden. And we used that soil to build a berm or two berms in the front yard also to be planted. And with all that soil movement that had to happen, it was nice to have a little bit of help from a tractor instead of doing it all myself with a shovel. So here it is again, uh, creating the actual rain garden basin. And here it is two months later on October 1st, you can see a lot of the plants were put in um, and bloomed very late. You don't normally see purple coneflowers and anise hyssop and black eyed Susans blooming in October, but uh, they were put in so late that they, they kind of got a late go at it. One of the things we intentionally did with this planting, we, I normally like to plant in spring, but in this case, since a lot of my neighborhood is very much focused on lawns, we wanted to have our, our gardens look nice as quickly as possible after planting. So we raised most of these plants ourselves in the backyard, and then we waited until many of these plants were starting to get ready to bloom in the pots. And then we started digging out the front yard and creating this area and planting them when they were just about to bloom. So that meant that within a week or two, we already had flowers in the front yard. And so people would walk by and they would get a much better idea of what this area was going to look like because the flowers were already starting to appear. And uh, here it is the following year in June where the plants are very well established. They're growing up very well. You can see the uh, plants along the path that kind of lead you out of the garden and you can see the rock pad there at the base of the downspout which absorbs the energy from all that water coming out. Here it is in August. So this is one year after planting and the garden is very well established. You can really not even tell that it's a rain garden. If you didn't know any better you'd think it was just a flower bed but you can see the water pouring out at high speed from that rain, uh, from that downspout. There's a lot of water coming out. This is about a one and a quarter inch storm that we had. And here it is the day after from the rooftops. You can see the, the rock pad there again at the base of the downspout, all the plants down there looking very happy and well watered the next day. So this is a video that I think will play of that particular storm on August 11th. So uh, you saw the picture that day and the day after, and this is the video of the actual storm happening. You can see the water is actually ponding in the lake, or uh, sorry, in the rain garden. So it did fill up with this particular storm. 
and just overflowed a little bit to the backside. There's a river birch tree and some other cardinal flowers and other things that are happy to receive a little bit of extra moisture in the back. So if it does fill up all the way, it runs away from the house and spills out about 30 feet from the house foundation next to a bunch of other moisture loving plants. So it works out fine. It never does make it to the road, even if we have a multiple inch storm, it, it never makes it all the way to the road. Uh, it soaks in somewhere else. Okay, uh, last year around that time in August, one of our neighbors walked by and he asked me a question when I was out there gardening. He said, do you get bugs eating your plants? And the answer is yes, I do sometimes see bugs eating my plants. Uh, it's not something that I tend to get worked up about. Some gardeners really dislike seeing some chewed up edges on their leaves or uh, holes in the middle of the leaf. I personally think that that's a good sign. It's a sign that I'm feeding caterpillars that will eventually turn into butterflies that I want to see. Um, so I don't mind seeing some herbivory in my garden by insects. Uh, the exception would be when Japanese beetles show up and they start eating everything. Uh, those are non-native insects, as you can guess from the name, they're Japanese beetles. And um, in the case of that insect, I do control those physically. I'll go out there with a bucket, a bucket of soapy water underneath the plant and I'll just tap the plant and then they fall off into the soapy water and that's the end of the Japanese beetles. Um, I also have to deal with oleander aphids, which are little orange aphids that like to be on milkweeds. And um, they're also a non-native insect. I do squish those with my fingers from time to time uh, if they're really infesting a milkweed a lot. Um, but other, other than that, I don't bother controlling any kind of native insects because they're all really part of the, the whole food web. Um, insects are really the link between the sun's energy being captured in plants and the rest of the entire food web around the world. So uh, insects are really the key for moving that energy up the food web and feeding everything else from amphibians to fish to birds and mammals. Um, so we really shouldn't be indiscriminately killing insects in our gardens. We should allow them to be there unless of course you're, you're seeing really nuisance level populations like the Japanese beetles sometimes create. So this particular bug here is a what uh, gardeners would sometimes call a parsley worm. And that name comes from the fact that they will eat anything in that family, the parsley family, the carrot family, uh, anything in that family, including parsley, dill, carrots, coriander, golden alexanders, angelica, cow parsnip, any of those things, queen anne's lace, those are all carrot family members. And so occasionally you'll see these guys eating your dill or your parsley or things like that. Um, but I'm very happy when I get to see one of these. As you can see, I got my camera out to photograph this little guy because it turns into one of our, our ma most magnificent butterflies here in the state, the black swallowtail. This is a monarch sized butterfly that uh, relies on members of the carrot family to be around, uh, at least for its caterpillars to eat. It will nectar on many, many different species, just like all adult butterflies do. They can, they can get nectar from all kinds of different groups of plants, but their caterpillars are often very specialized to a certain group. This is a compilation of some of the butterflies that we saw in our garden over the last two years here since we created it. We've seen over two dozen species of native butterflies here, and there's one non-native one, the cabbage white, which is a very common butterfly species, not represented here on the slide. But this just gives you an idea of some of the diversity of different butterflies that we've seen here. And we try to capture each one of them in a picture, but don't always get them. So we may have more than we realize we've had in the, in the yard, but uh, we've been really impressed with the diversity of butterflies that showed up because we're providing a diversity of native plants for them to feed on. So another thing I wanted to touch on is when you're creating a rain garden, if you don't have a lot of slope and you don't want, uh, or maybe you don't have an, an area that's far enough away from the foundation along that particular side of the house or something, you can also move the water away. This is a picture from our old house where I had a rain barrel taking the water from the downspout. And then I had a two inch PVC overflow that was epoxied on. And I ran that into the ground underneath our walkway here on the side of the garage and ran it through, in this case, about 35 feet of this uh, two inch pipe underground. And I had that spill out 
into this rain garden. In our backyard, we had a lot more space and we also had a natural slope, as you can see in the photo here on the right side, that's several feet higher than the left side. So we also had a wet basement issue there, a lot of moisture in the walls and occasionally a little bit of standing water on the floor. So we wanted to get that water away from the house as much as possible and ideally get it below this slope that was in the backyard. So we dumped it into this rain garden and you can see this is a fairly small rain garden but it intercepted all the water and then dumped out to the left. So ultimately we really have a choice uh, based on our landscape decisions, whether we want our lakes and streams to look like this with stringy algae and sometimes toxic blue-green algae like you see in the, the right photo, or we can have lakes and rivers that look more like this, where the water is clear, the fish and the wildlife are abundant and healthy, and there's a diverse aquatic plant community on the shoreline and in the lake. Um, everything is in balance and uh, everybody's happy. So that's really what we should be striving for. And we can make that happen by just making simple decisions on the landscape to contain our pollution, contain our soil on the shoreline instead of letting it erode into the water. And when we can't reduce our pollution on the landscape anymore, we, we make sure that we contain it as much as possible before we allow it to get into our waterways. So uh, with that, uh, the answer really is we try to contain it. As I said, I'm going to move on to Patrick now. Patrick's slides are in a little bit different format from mine, so I'm going to switch over to Patrick's presentation here in a few seconds, and uh, Amy Kowalski from our office will introduce Patrick. Okay, Paul, did you want to answer any of the questions then once you do the switch over? There were some specific questions in the chat. Um, yeah, I'd like to introduce Patrick Goggin. Um, he works closely with the Wisconsin Lakes Partnership team, collaborating on the development of educational programming and materials for people in, around, in and around our lakes. Uh, areas of interest for him include helping lake organizations with their community goals, um, sharing lake management tools and resources for aquatic ecosystems, and aiding people in gaining a better understanding and appreciation for the native flora of Wisconsin lakeshores. He works uh, with Extension Lakes in the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point College of Natural Resources. And um, he is in the Rhinelander uh, Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources Service Center, but currently working out of his home <laughs> as most of us are. So Patrick, please. And Amy, regarding your question, I think we'll wait with all the questions until the end to give Patrick time to do his presentation. Okay, great. Okay, Patrick, go ahead and take it away and just let me know when you need me to advance the slide. Can you hear me okay? I hear you now, Pat. Okay, good afternoon. Yeah, and uh, I'm coming to you from my COVID bunker here in Phelps. Uh, so what I, next slide please, Paul. So what we're going to go through is a native plant, uh, 350 square foot planting that's part of the Healthy Lakes program, but it's also the kind of project that anyone can just take and do it yourself. And so um, we'll be going through a guide that was created as part of the Healthy Lakes program to help uh, guide landowners through a native planting best practice installation. And so we work through in that guide um, with fact sheets, the scale is small first step. We have six online, or excuse me, six options to choose from in the guide, each with a different target that you might have from a planting point of view. As I say, it can be a do-it-yourself type approach, or you can utilize the Surface Water Grant Program and the Healthy Lakes Grant option. So uh, go to the next slide, if you would, please, Paul. So in tax shorelines, look like this. We have our three tiers of vegetation, trees, shrubs in the midsection, a ground layer of sedges, wildflowers, ferns, and rushes. But unfortunately, over the years, next slide, we've changed things up a little bit. And so we used to have pretty modest, small little cabins like this on our lake shores, 800 square feet. Next slide, please. And you can see these small little um, cabins didn't have have tons of impact to the lake. You know, Paul talked about the nutrient impulse. Well, in these small cabins, we didn't have the impervious surfaces that we do today. We have a little bit of runoff you see there, 
some phosphorus and a little sediment coming off this site. But let's go to what more of a modern day uh, lakeshore looks like. Next slide, please. So we've started to put in much larger structures beginning after the war and moving through to today. And you see here a four to 5,000 square foot structure on a shoreline. All those impervious or hard surfaces, you see a rooftop there. You have a driveway probably behind it that's black topped, a, a garage, the doghouse at the shore. All these uh, hard surfaces are shedding water and if we don't manage that water correctly, you can see that our runoff volume is five times greater, our phosphorus input is six times greater, and that dirty water, the sediments, 18 times as much dirt getting in through those hard surfaces. So we really have to do what Paul was talking about, manage that water on the upland part uh, as the property as best we can. Next slide, please. And so you see the numbers here. You see the runoff to the lake jump to 5,000 from 1,000. Instead of 0.3, oh, excuse me, 0.03 phosphorus hitting the lake, these larger structures tend to add more phosphorus to the runoff. And then the sediment pulse, just lots more sediment moving off our properties from these larger structures. Next slide, please. And we've been studying this in Wisconsin and it's come up in our, our three iterations of the National Lakes Assessment where you can see that black box kind of covering the letters up. It says lakeshore habitat there at the top. And that's the number one stressor to our lakes is the loss of that tree, mid-layer and ground layer vegetation along our shore. Next slide, please. And like I say, we've been studying these impacts in the state of Wisconsin, whether it's fish communities, our songbirds changing between undeveloped and developed situations. When we know when the number of dwellings increase on our shorelines, we lose, start to lose species or see changes. Next slide, please. The good news is we can use healthy lakes back practices, both in the upland zone that transition zone where our native planting we'll talk about today is, and even doing some work in the lake, things like fish sticks. Okay, next slide, please. And so the area we're gonna be concentrating on here for our native planting is right at that land water interface. So we could look at the diagram at the top here, and we know that we have a gradation moving from the water's edge up slope and different kinds of moisture requirements or even standing water challenges with each of those different zones. I shared in the chat box earlier a document called Plants for Stormwater Design that has some great lists by each one of these different zones. And I encourage you to look at that document if you're looking for ideas for specific plants in each one of those zones. Next slide, please. So, in the Healthy Lakes best practice, it's a 350 square foot native planting. A nice first step kind of um, stewardship activity that any landowner can take along a lake, river, or stream. And you can shape these native plantings using the Healthy Lakes best practice the way you need to fit it on the shore. They have to be at least 10 feet wide, but it could be say an 18 by 19 foot square shape or it could be more of a L shape where we have 10 feet of uh, shoreline along the shore going for 35 feet kind of thing. Next slide, please. Next slide, please, thanks. So for each one of our Healthy Lakes best practices, we have a fact sheet, which you see on the left, and a companion guide, which you see on the right. The fact sheet points out some important things for you to pay attention to. One of the questions that's come up in the chat box is, do I need permits for some of these best practices? And the answer is, it depends on the best practice. Typically for native plantings, as you see on the fact sheet there, uh, the bottom circle, we don't usually need permits, but you might need a county permit. So we encourage you to talk to your county land and water conservation or zoning department to see if a, a permit is needed. But typically when we're doing straight ahead native plantings and following the shoreline habitat 693 code, um, we're not moving in enough soil or, or putting plants into the lake bed itself. So a permit typically is not needed. But the fact sheet you see goes through some of the costs, the materials you'll need for the best practice and lists out how you go about uh, embarking on 
doing your best practice, in this case, a native planting. And then the companion guide is meant to be a technical reference to help walk you through making the choices that come together to do a good project. Next slide, please. So in the guide, which you can find here at the Healthy Lakes standalone website you see listed there, let's jump into the guide and see what's in there. Next slide, please, Paul. So within the guide, you'll see six planting options, each with maybe a different goal that you might have as a landowner. The one I'll spend some time on here is Lakeshore Edge. This is that land water interface that Paul was talking about, a wet foot situation typically, um, but we might have other goals in mind for our shoreland planting. So the other five options include bird butterfly. This is more of those pollinator plants, including host and nectar plants that help support pollinators in our migratory birds. Another thing we've talked about is the challenge that comes with erosion forces, either coming down slope off the upland part of your parcel or wave and wind energy hitting the, the, the uh, nearshore area from the lakeside. And so the third planting option is bare soil is meant to a suite of plants that have those fibrous root systems and really can help stabilize that area through a, a, a planting. The fourth one is low growing. We've heard from our customers around the state that being able to see uh, children swimming in the swim area or, or or just being able to maintain a view corridor is important. So that's a suite of plants that don't get above your knee, still have the functions that come with native plants in terms of uh, helping with clean water and wildlife habitat, but they don't get too tall. And then the final two, deer resistant. These are plants that deer tend to, to um, stay away from. They'll still hit them if you give them a chance and they're super hungry. But the idea is these are plants that are a little more resistant to deer pressure. And then the last planting is woodland, a shade scenario. So let's take a closer look. Next slide, please, Paul. So here's the Lakeshore Edge. And have to give kudos to Karen Engelbretson, our graphic designer, who helped lay out an example of how you can put these beds into play on your own shoreline. And through Karen's illustration, you'll see just ideas about how you can lay these plants out. So for each plant, so we have Lakeshore Edge. Go ahead, Paul, next one. Here's our bird butterfly. So this one she made more into a circle planting with our woody plant, the white oak, acting as an anchor. And then you see the other plants put around. And again, the bird and butterfly is meant to support migratory birds and our pollinators. Next slide. Here's the third one, that bare soil erosion control type scenario where we have these fibrous root systems and plants that uh, do the heavy lifting of stabilizing our shoreline area. Next slide, please. Again, low growing. It's really important, as I said, to be able to see those kids swimming in the water, um, that kind of thing. But another thing, by putting this line of vegetation across that land water interface at the shoreline's edge, we can deter those geese that might be coming up onto our lawn and, and adding as much as five or six pounds of poop per week per bird. And that's really a health concern. It's really a health uh, risk. And so by putting this native vegetation back and that firm, low growing bush right at the land water interface, we can keep those geese from um, uh, hitting our shoreline. Next slide, please. Here's the deer resistant option. So again, these are plants that either have an odor to them or something about them that seems to keep deer and rabbit from um, hitting them as hard as they do other plants. And then finally, the next slide, please, is our woodland or more shade tolerant type species um, that can be utilized um, in a planting. So let's go a little further. Next slide, please. So for each one of the planting lists, uh, except for the lakeshore edge, which we assume is wet, we give you two sets of uh, plants for each one of the other five planting options. So for the bird butterfly through the woodland one, we set the plants up into two lists according to soil moisture levels. So one of the challenges that comes with doing native plantings 
along shorelines is we can sometimes move from wet feet situations to dry foot situations really quickly. And so paying attention to that and understanding the rhythm of life on that shoreline uh, is where you choose the right plant list here. I would say if you have fluctuating water levels and you're moving between dry and wet soils, you're gonna wanna um, pay attention to that and uh, use species that can tolerate that. So I would go with more of the moist wet species, even if you know it's dry at some time. Next slide, please. And these plantlets were, are a little bit of a challenge to develop because uh, we are trying to cover the whole state, of course. So know that within the um, plant list, you'll see maybe a plant that you don't recognize or you don't typically see in your area. Um, a whole lot, you could always swap that plant out for another plant that's like it. So we have a substitution policy. So say it's an aster, a fall blooming plant. We just ask you that if you uh, can't find the aster that uh, is on the list, we ask you to use another fall plant uh, blooming at the same time and roughly about the same size. There's more on the substitution policy within the native plant guide itself. Okay, next slide, please. And really what we're trying to do is utilize species that uh, do the heavy lifting for us. They have traits, uh, either they're fibrous root systems or maybe they're an aggressive cedar like uh, columbine or, or, or wild bergamot and they fill in the space quickly and really help create vegetation. The other thing we're trying to do is, is, is create a, a a layer of vegetation like you see in this Chicago Botanic Garden shoreline restoration here. Starting out in the water with one kind of plant that's uh, um, either a sedge or maybe a standing emergent plant like a pickerel weed. And then as we move towards shore, you see the different zones of plantings there. And we can plant these layers of vegetation horizontal to that, that water's edge and create a, a nice native plant fortress, if you will, with deep penetrating root structures, rhizominous roots that, that spread out and really hold the soil. And the other good thing they do is support wildlife in great ways. Next slide, please. And here are those root structures. Uh, Paul showed you the diagram and his, here, here is some actual root structures from plants that have grown a year that the UW Arboretum worked on. Uh, on the left, the swamp milk lead, Asclepius incarnata, in the middle is Aster puniceus, and then on the far right is one of our grasses, the blue joint grass, Calmagrostis canadensis. But this is just one year's growth of uh, the fibrous root structures, and you can see uh, what we're talking about here for the roots. Next slide, please. Here's some more. That's Carex vulpinoide on the top left. Carex stipata, I believe, in the middle. Carex hystrocina on the right. So again, these, these sedges really do the heavy lifting of fibrous root structures that hold the soil. And then on the bottom, it looks like we have a, some more wildflowers, verbena hostata, the blue vervain, uh, Heliopsis helianthoides, the oxide daisy, and then black-eyed Susan rudbeckia herti in the bottom right. So again, these root structures, so important to helping stabilize uh, our shoreland areas. Next slide, please. So here's what that planting can look like. Again, this is a 350 square foot healthy lakes planting. This one's more linear. They went 10 feet back and 35 feet across. And again, now they have a nice buffer for any upland water that's trying to make its way with that dirt or phosphorus pulses. It's all being intercepted by this native planting. Next slide, please. There is maintenance involved. As Paul says, the good news is it's usually less than it would be if it were lawn or other types of plantings. We got some options here. You could get an Anatolian shepherd like the guy up on the upper left. If you can't uh, do that, other options, you see some of the deer deterrent and browse deterrent products out there like liquid fence, which is I believe garlic based or plant skid, the Swedish product, which is blood meal based. I use them both to pretty good success. Melagranite's another one, you get the fertilizer and the smell. Or you could go with temporary fencing like you see pictured in the bottom left. 
That's from the Wisconsin Lakeshore Restoration Project up in Vilas County where they used temporary fencing for three years around shoreland plantings and then uh, took the fencing down. Okay, next slide please. So the way, if you're interested in using Healthy Lakes grants and um, not going the do-it-yourself route, those grants are due February 1st. It's a 75-25 match, reimbursed from the state. You see the eligible sponsors listed there. It's typically our lake organizations, county units of government, uh, municipal units of government, et cetera. It's a two-year grant agreement with the best practice capped at $1,000 to do your native planting or other best practice. The, the participants send a 10 year contract which basically says they will operate and maintain that native planting or other best practice for the 10 years of the, of the life of the project. And we as a Healthy Lakes team check out many of these projects five to 10% a year just to get feedback and see how things are going. Next slide, please. We've installed almost 400 of these native plantings through the Healthy Lakes program to date. Those are the ones we know about that were funded through the grant. Uh, we like to think that lots of do-it-yourselfers are out there doing this as well. Next slide, please. Uh, I just wanted to reiterate, you know, one of the things you'll see in these plant lists is we do follow the shoreline habitat standard, which has a woody component one tree and usually two to three shrubs per 350 square foot of planting. Some folks might not think this woody component is important, but as Doug Tellamy's research is showing us early in the season, like right now, these woody plants are vital to not just pollinators, but a whole suite of wildlife that utilizes the, uh, the buds, the nectar, the, the sap, the, the flowers, you name it, off these woody plants to make a living out there on the landscape. So check Doug's books out if you're learning, looking to learn more about the rhythm of life as it relates to woody plants and pollinators. Next slide, please. As Paul mentioned, one of the things we do with these best practices sometimes is add a little, we call them cue to care. Showing the neighbors that, you know, this is a consciously uh, cool thing we're doing, but we put little things like the go pack go sign in or the, the upper left picture you see the drift of uh, Black Eyed Susan with the, the uh, stone edge around it and the nice s curve line. These are all things we can do to our planting uh, to make it look a little more uh, less wild and a little more accepting perhaps to a neighbor who thinks it might look messy. Next slide, please. So candidates can look like this, you know, lawn to the edge, no, maybe the canopy is still there. In this case, you see some of the big trees are still there, but that shrub layer, that ground layer is seriously impacted. And so great candidate, Plus we have the rooftops from those, th those two cabins kind of making, uh, shedding water and maybe that water is starting to cause problems on those properties. Next slide, please. Here's another scenario. Uh, just an average landowner could be just about any place in Wisconsin, but lawn to the edge, you see a little bit of slope coming down from the house. That, that sh roof shed is starting to send the water. Um, and so lots of cool possibilities, maybe even using a rain garden and a native planting, for example, in this kind of, but whether it's a resort, a homeowner like this, a boat landing, lots of places where we can do this. Next slide, please. So here's an example, a private bar resort who owns a little boat landing with a gate. I think there's tons of opportunities and sites like this of where we can control water, maybe further up, uh, on the boat access and add a native planting down by shore that adds a little beauty as well as some function uh, to help with clean water and habitat on the lake. Next slide, please. And so again, Healthy Lakes is out there to help support this. Here's another example of a native planting. You see those, those deep penetrating sedge plants in the front and the wildflowers uh, starting in back. Next slide, please. 
Other states are doing this too, you know, with these webinars. I know we've been getting people from outside Wisconsin sometimes, so know that this work is being done in the Midwest and other lake country across the United States. And there's some great guides out there in other states and or programs to help you connect to doing this kind of work. Next slide, please. You know, one of the cool things about Healthy Lakes is the champions, the people doing it themselves are, are helping us tell the story of why and, and how they're doing things. And so here's an example, Carol Aita with uh, uh, the Beaver Dam Lake Association and District uh, telling us about the rain garden she put in. And this year she has two more best practices that she's embarking on. And so people like this are just critical for us in helping make uh, for better uh, habitat situations and cleaner water. Next slide, please. And, uh, you know, if we restore the land, maybe we can get as lucky as this is a picture of Bowen Lake uh, showing all the wildlife that they have found through the uh, artwork of Karen Engelbertson again, showing the frogs, the bird life, the mammals, the fishery, all the different wildlife going on in that lake. And so I think uh, once we start to restore some of these shorelands with native plantings like this or rain gardens, we can start to see more of this wildlife habitat and activity. Next slide, please. And so we have a standalone website called Healthy Lakes uh, for you to check out each of the best practices that is listed there. The fact sheet I mentioned, the companion document, little how-to videos on how to create a grant application are there and lots of resources to help you get started uh, with your Healthy Lakes best practice. You can either apply for the grant itself or make it a do-it-yourself do type project. Next slide, please. With that, I think, uh, why don't we jump into questions, Paul? Great, thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, Amy is going to facilitate the Q&A for us. So Amy, if you just want to start at the top and we'll work our way down. Okay, sounds good. Um, we did have some uh, that were answered thanks to others that were on the, on the webinar. So thank you very much to those, um, those subject matter experts for helping out. Um, so I think we answered some of the regulation guideline um, questions. Patrick had put information in there. It's good to kind of talk to your uh, local county land and water conservation department um, and zoning offices about that. Um, yeah, I think Amy, just to reiterate or to reinforce that if, if you have any questions about whether your project needs a permit, that's really the place to ask. Okay, and um, so one of the questions was, we have waterfront and a lawn. Um, we have natural sand beaches along that waterfront. Does sand help fin filter runoff? Um, well, it's not zero, but uh, you might have, so yeah, I mean, sand does infiltrate some water. The idea here is though, as that water moves downhill and you just have grass or even bare ground that's just sand, without vegetation there, there's nothing to slow that water down. And so part of what that native vegetation is doing, those three tiers of vegetation, trees, mid layer and ground layer, is think about it also as a sponge. It's also absorbing that water and not letting it gain the momentum and move downhill to carry dirt and, and phosphorus to the lake. And so just having that vegetation in that near shore area or in upland parts of your um, property through things like rain gardens um, really can make a difference in not letting that dirty water get to the lake in the first place. Okay, and actually Brent Bellinger also um, put in about that, that uh, to put a plant buffer strip unmowed behind the beach is a good idea as well. Yeah, so, you know, I get that people are using their lakeshore areas and these are very active places. And so the, what the challenge for us as property owners is to find that balance. And so is there a way we can keep the beach maybe still intact, but maybe put, as Brent says, a buffer or, or some kind of uh, intercepting uh, of that water above that beach so that that dirty water doesn't make it to the lake. 
Yeah, and Patrick, you kind of talked a little bit about this, but um, uh, Tracy was asking that she she has um, her lake level is exceptionally high and is eroding the shoreline. And so she was wondering what kind of plants tolerate wide swings in water levels from little water to 10 inches underwater. So one of the resources I threw in the chat box is a document called Plants for Stormwater Design by Dan Shaw. And I, I forget the other gentleman's name with the Minnesota Pollution Control in Minnesota. And what Dan did is put together in that guide a list of plants by that the zonation we see along waterways. So starting with standing water situations of one to three feet and moving upslope, he gives you different lists of plants for each one of those zones. So take a look at the Dan's list for standing water and I'd go with those plants. The other tip I always share with people is think about our ditches across Wisconsin. A lot of our ditches are that kind of habitat. Right now they're chock full of snow melt and standing water from, from uh, maybe rain events and they're pretty wet. Well, in about a month, they usually dry out and become a drier situation. So a lot of the plants that I think about, things like fireweed or some of those sedges I mentioned uh, that can take uh, standing water uh, uh, and then dryness too. So take a look at the Shaw book and, um, and maybe look in the wet ditches along your, um, your part of the world and see what native plants you see in those ditches. And those might be plants worth emulating along your shoreline. Yeah, I would touch on that a little bit too. And in, in a project here on campus in our natural area, it's called Schmeekly Reserve. We have a large area where we removed Phragmites and planted native plants into it. We put about 9,000 plugs into this site. And in one of the areas we have seen water level swings uh, in excess of a foot uh, over the course of just a day from a storm. And the things that really survived well were, were mostly things in the sedge family. So several things in the in Carrick's uh, species. So bottle brush sedge, porcupine sedge, lake sedge. We also had things that uh, also in the sedge family like bulrushes and um, spike rushes. Those are also doing really well there. The irises are doing well. Burr reeds are doing well. But a lot of other, other things there we put the uh, for mostly color and for display like blazing stars. Uh, we put some cardinal flowers in there, Joe pie weeds, things like that. We had a really hard time keeping those alive because they couldn't take that water level fluctuation. So I would echo uh, Patrick's comments that really focus on sedges in that type of situation. They are really well adapted to take a lot of water level change. Paul, did you guys try any grasses like blue joint or cord grass? Uh, we did put a little bit of cord grass in, and that's the only grass that we used. Uh, the reason for that is that we wanted to be able to spot new Phragmites shoots. Oh, sure. Yep, so we didn't want to put a bunch of grasses in to just confuse people that may be helping with that project. Is the cord grass making it? The cord grass is making it as long as it's closer to the edge of the wetland area, not in the, in the middle where it's getting really flooded badly. Okay, so not super deep. So cord grass might be another choice. Yeah, yep. sounds good. Yep. And Amy, I saw there was another question up at the top about uh, monarchs uh, raising them indoors. Oh, yes. uh, I'll, I'll touch on that one quickly. So Heather asked if monarchs raised indoors are unable to migrate. And uh, one of the ways, if you are raising monarchs indoors, it is important to expose particularly the last generation to cold and to shorter day length because that's what the research is showing tends to cue them to migrate. So if you do raise them indoors, um, they, they don't seem to get that cue that, hey, it's getting cold and it's getting a shorter day length outside. I need to think about migrating. So the last couple of generations that we raise here, starting in, in July, we put the tanks that we were raising these caterpillars out uh, into our screen porch. So they're exposed to the temperatures outside uh, during the day and the night, and they're exposed to the shortening day length. And so um, we have um, heard from this, these research studies that that seems to be the main driver to get these things to decide to fly south. So um, it's a great question. And it's an important thing if you are raising them inside to make sure that the, the last generation that's going to be migrating is exposed to those conditions. Okay, one of the questions was about native plants that are more deer resistant. And I think Patrick touched on that. Um, there is um, in the native planting companion guide, there are 
those different options for um, plants. And there are some plants that are um, a little bit more deer resistant than others. Uh, and then uh, Valerie uh, Stabenow uh, answered a question about removing an existing cement seawall um, and restoring the shoreline. She said to make sure to check with local ordinances and the DNR uh, because removing the seawall can open up your shoreline to an erosion, um, if, especially if there's high wind or water levels. So did you want to touch on that a little more, Patrick? Yeah, that'll need a permit. So I would encourage um, that person to um, consult their local land and water conservation and zoning shop. And when they do, I would ask for uh, a listing if they can provide it of local uh, landscapers or erosion control um, type um, field people that can help them with a project like that. Because they're going to need some engineering help to get that kind of project done. Lana Water Shop sometimes have cost share money that can help with those kind of projects. So that's the other reason it can be a good place to start. Okay, and that kind of answers, um, Jan Ward had asked, just asked if uh, shoreline erosion was discussed. Um, and Patrick, you did mention that, you know, a lot of these fibrous root structures are very helpful. Um, depends on, I guess, the, the amount of erosion. That's right. And, um, the other thing I would encourage if someone's looking for more resources or maybe another webinar on erosion control uh, more deeply, there's resources on our Extension Lakes webpage under the Wisconsin Lakeshore Restoration Project um, uh, that lists different erosion control techniques and uh, has some fact sheets and information there. So I encourage you to uh, look at that part of our website. Okay, uh, there are a couple of questions, Paul, about the uh, rain gardens. One um, asked about uh, small rain gardens at the end of major downspout, um, one or two small rain gardens, and then also what kind of stone did you use in the rain garden? They didn't quite catch that. Okay, so touching on the stone first, the, the field stones around the outside are just stones that were uh, picked up from a colleague that has a farm that had a ton of extra rocks laying around. So I went and just handpicked the ones that I wanted that were about maybe six to eight inches in diameter. And I used those for the outside. And then the rock pad within the rain garden just for absorbing the energy from the downspout, those are just smaller ones. So they're, they're two to three inch diameter stones that are just in a small pile there. Um, and Dave's question about a small rain garden at the end of a major downspout or two, uh, that's it's exactly what I like to do using those downspouts and taking all that water. Um, at our old house, we had three rain gardens. We had three major downspouts. We had one that took a little bit of water and three that took a lot. And so at the end of each one, we had a rain garden. Uh, and I mentioned we had water issues in the basement of that house. We took every one of those downspouts underground for at least 10 feet until it reached a rain garden. And within about a month and a half or month, uh, two months, we didn't have any issues in the, in the basement anymore. So it was amazing how much difference that made just by putting on gutters on the house and directing all that water away from the house. We eliminated our basement issue. Um, so yes, it's definitely something you could do. Dave, you can have more than one. Um, just keep in mind if you're running a major downspout to a very small rain garden, it's gonna fill up very quickly and then you have to think about where that extra water is gonna go. So make sure you send that in the right direction. Okay, Lynn has had some issues of a lot of water level changing. So, um, you know, sometimes 10 to 20 feet of mud and muck along the shoreline. And sometimes, you know, there's just a lot of water coming closer and closer to the, to the dwelling. So um, any suggestions there? Uh, is that unique? As she said, she's had, a, they've had a lot of, uh, 500 year floods in the last 30 years. <laughs> no, uh, that certainly is a challenge of late in the last 10 years. We've had our wettest years and our big, and we've had, you know, in some places they've had two or three of those so-called 500 year storms. So this isn't going away. Um, I would say in terms of them, if it's a mucky soil and if it's, a, you know, acidic, maybe more boggy plants would do well there. Um, just a guess on my part I, without seeing it. Um, Paul, any ideas? Well, I guess I would again say sedges would be a good option because there is a lot of change in water level. Um, again, I, I think I'm 
assuming the same thing as Pat reading the question that if it is a lot of organic muck, then it probably is a more acidic, boggier condition. So things like arrowheads or pickerel weeds would be nice ones. They, both of those species can tolerate being uh, standing in, in just moist soil or being in a couple feet of water. So they can tolerate a lot of water level movement along the shoreline there. So um, those would be my suggestions, I guess. Okay. So um, on that same tolerance idea, uh, another question from Amy was um, anything that specifically tolerates road salt well or um, maybe drought conditions in a bioswale, like 15 to 20 feet um, away from a river branch? Yeah, I would look at the things that grow in the roadside medians uh, and, and ditches. So we do see a lot of New England aster and a couple other aster species, the swamp aster, um, uh, smooth blue aster. Those ones are things you'll naturally just see along the roadsides. And so you can assume that they are finding or they're, they're receiving road salt input. So I would take that cue and add those species in. Um, let's see. Cord I would even look, for, is another look one. I was going to say, look in the actual... Uh, native plant guides for detention basin bioswale, either seed mixes or plant lists. Um, to Paul's point, uh, I think you'll you'll see those wildflowers and grasses listed there. Mm -hmm. um, um, but you know, plants that can deal with 24 to 48 hours in that drain, you know, it's many of the common plants we're talking about. Marsh milkweed, New England aster, uh, Joe pie, bone set, oxide, sunflower, the blazing stars. We talked about irises, uh, black and sweet-eyed Susans. Um, so uh, look at the detention basin bioswale species lists or seed mix lists uh, in the catalogs. Okay, a couple more rain garden questions. One about um, maintenance, wondering uh, if weeds or encroaching grasses need to be removed. And then the next question about how to market this to subdivision associations. Uh, yeah, so on marketing, uh, Patrick mentioned those cues to care, and they are extremely important. And I sort of alluded to the, the fact that my neighborhood here is mostly irrigated lawns. Uh, the true green truck seems to be here every week, at least once during the, the summer. And so we really had to keep that in mind that we wanted, we wanted this native planting idea to spread to more people. We wanted people to accept it and, and like the idea and maybe put in a native planting in, in their area as well. Um, so we use these paver borders around the outside because it does keep weed encroachment down. It keeps the turf from crowding in. It makes it look more finished and more intentional. We have a sign next to the road that says uh, it's a Monarch Way Station. It is a certified Monarch Way Station through Monarch Watch. Um, so it talks about the, the, the value to monarchs of these native plants. So there's clearly a purpose to this whole design. We intentionally uh, go out of our way to talk to people walking by and, and people, uh, our, our adjacent neighbors. We have an abundance of flowers in the summer and my daughter actually picks bouquets. We bought a bunch of, of cheap vases and my daughter delivers bouquets of flowers from our yard to all the adjacent neighbors. And it does this on a weekly basis. So people give us the vase back and we give them a refill. Um, but it's a way for, people to appreciate the, the flowers that we have and we have a path that goes through it. So it leads right from, to our front door. They can take the sidewalk along the house or they can also go right through the middle of the garden. And we very much encourage people to do that. Uh, you may have seen the, the sedges, the um, Carex bicknellii, the Bicknell's sedge we had planted along the path. We put in two rows of those, one on each side of the path. So it, it creates a way to, to guide your eye into the middle of the garden and toward the front door. But it also hopefully invites people to move their feet that way and actually walk right through it and appreciate what's going on there. So um, I guess my answer is we try to get people to really understand the value of this property uh, and these, the things that we're doing on our property. And we encourage them to get very close to see all the value that's going on. Uh, we also, 
allow kids in the neighborhood to come over and get a, a monarch caterpillar or two. And we raise monarch uh, milkweeds in pots to give them. We also have a, a small glass aquariums with screen lids that we loan out to these kids. So we provide them with everything they need to raise a couple of monarchs in their home. And again, it's just a way for them to take back a piece of our native planting to their house so they can learn to appreciate it. And that's, that's worked really well for us. Um, some of these subdivision associations, yes, they're using lawn services, they're using pesticides and things like that. They're clearly uh, interested in the way that their property looks and they're concerned about looking good and, and looking like a responsible citizen. So going back to those cues to care again, I think that's extremely important just to show that you are taking care of your landscape and these things are intentional. And that's, that's what it's all about, whether you're doing pesticides or you're putting in uh, gardens of any kind. Um, the idea is just to show that you're doing it in, on purpose and these are maintained intentional plantings with a purpose. And I think- so Just to add a couple other things, Amy, um, I would suggest that they use low growing vegetation in those um, early projects instead of leggy plants that get unkept and out of uh, place. So keep in mind that if it's a small space that use small size plants and low growing vegetation, it'll look better. The density of the planting, we're not putting in wood chip um, beds, we're putting in native plant beds. <laughs> and so the density, making sure there's a plant every foot, foot and a half or so, instead of just big piles of wood chips, uh, I think can bring a, a more of an aesthetic quality. From a maintenance point of view, you'll see in the Healthy Lakes Guide, those plants were purposely put into drifts, clumps of nine to 10, 12 plants in, in um, their own little sections. Maintenance wise, you might have to watch out that one plant doesn't jump into one drift. If you want to maintain that aesthetic look, you have to do some maintenance there. And then the last tip for homeowner groups or lake groups um, is when you do embark on doing native plantings or rain gardens, do a demonstration site on your, in your area and do it really well. Make sure that it's done super, um, um, to spec, make sure it looks good, and because that is going to be the project that your community looks at as the litmus test of, am I going to do this or not? And I yep. think both Patrick and Paul touched on this, and we found um, from our Healthy Lakes and Rivers uh, sites that most people listen to their neighbors and talk to their neighbors when they see them doing something, they ask, oh, what are you doing? And, oh, I kind of like this. What's the information? So really um, word of mouth is probably what we've seen works the best um, and those cues to care, which is kind of like word of mouth. So go ahead, Paul, sorry. Yeah, and I was gonna expand on those low growing plants. I completely agree with Patrick. That's a really important point to make that people tend to accept these new gardens when they're not six feet tall, uh, especially if those plants are falling over the road or they're falling over a sidewalk or something like that. Then it's just, people look at them as somewhat of a nuisance. So I would encourage any new gardens to be using plants less than about three feet tall. Uh, we do have a couple of plants that are, that I really like, but they tend to get a little taller than that. And those are the New England Aster and the Sky Blue Aster. Um, so what I do in the front yard where we have the shorter plants is I go out there in July and I hack those off to about a foot tall. So I cut off part of the top of the plant and that encourages it to be a little bit shorter and bushier. It actually produces more flowers that way because it tends to produce a lot more side branches. And you get these shorter, more compact bush forming asters instead of these very tall, more leggy uh, asters that look a little bit out of place. So that's one trick to keep your plants short, even if you're, uh, if you got a few species that maybe get taller than that. Um, we also used a border of June grass around the outside, which is a fairly short clump forming grass that's very straight. It forms a very straight column that's about a foot and a half tall. And so again, it forms kind of a, a line around the borders that makes it look very intentional and designed. And those stiff clumps also hold back anything that might try to lean out of the garden. So it provides a little bit more structure along the outsides. And I think I had one more thing I was gonna mention, but I forgot. So we can move on to the next thing. Okay, there, there was a, a couple of questions about, so 
Um, one about best way to remove existing lawn. I know Patrick, you have some suggestions. And then talking about um, fertilizer. Someone was asking, um, what about the nitrogen in fertilizers? Yeah, so the three approaches to um, site prep that I talk about with folks are uh, four millimeter to six millimeter black plastic, eight pages of uh, old fashioned newspaper or cardboard. So straight ahead cardboard, like you see for appliances, that kind of thing without tape on it and a bunch of stickiness. But you're, when it comes to the newspaper and cardboard, you can lay that down, especially in small planting areas or even grab a piece of rug from the dump and use that. I use all three of those kinds of natural products to create um, so you leave the black plastic in place for about 8 to 12 weeks. It does take that long to kill the vegetation. Then you can peel the black plastic um, back and spot treat any um, green spots that still persist. Newspaper and cardboard are kind of cool in that you put that down and wet it, eight pages of newspaper or one chunky piece of cardboard. And after three or four weeks of that, sitting with um, some water on top of it, you can plant right into it. The third alternative is to use a um, chemical treatment. And so you can use the um, herbicides that are out there and follow the directions on those herbicides. Accordingly, know that if you're doing this kind of work near water, you need to use a special waterborne type glyphosate uh, Roundup is the trade name. And uh, what's the one near water? Um, not Roundup, but Rodeo. Uh, Rodeo, thank you. Yep. Yeah, and I would also, I, I, I very much support the idea of using tarps or plastic uh, or the cardboard newspaper method, especially along lake shores. You really don't want to do a lot of digging. Um, sometimes I get impatient around here and I'll just start digging a, a little new garden out because I can plant it pretty much immediately, but I'm not near water. So uh, you don't want to create a bunch of erosion problems right next to your lake shore. So digging is not a, a good option there. Um, I very much support the idea of using smothering with whatever technique, uh, any of those ones that Patrick already talked about. As far as the phosphorus and nitrogen, um, nitrogen generally is not a limiting nutrient in freshwater lakes, so that's why we hear so much about phosphorus being the culprit for algae blooms and, uh, and cyanobacteria blooms and things like that. Um, Nitrogen is usually a limiting nutrient in saltwater environments. So even if it's not a, causing a problem here, it may be running off ultimately into the Mississippi River and then causing pro problems down in the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. So neither one of those is really something we want to just be applying in excess uh, anyway. You should be applying fertilizers of any kind in the, the amount that they're actually needed, if they're needed at all. Um, and nitrogen causes other problems as well. So we're, uh, we're getting kind of off on a tangent about that. But um, the last question, I guess, as part of that, is it acceptable to use phosphorus-free fertilizer on turf? Again, it's better if you're thinking about limiting the amount of phosphorus that's entering the lake and feeding algae and feeding nuisance plant growth and things like that, then yes. Um, but again, use fertilizers of any kind where they're needed in the amount that they're actually needed. And someone did mention that uh, there is a no phosphorus rule for lawns in Wisconsin. So thank you, Julie, for that. Um, I had a question about, uh, can you do anything with a cattail shoreline? And I know that there are native and non-native cattails. Do you want to talk to that? Well, I can start and I'll turn it over to Patrick for his yeah, thoughts Paul's on that. Yeah, Paul's got more experience uh, than me on this one. <laughs> So cattails, as Amy said, we have multiple species here. We have a native broadleaf cattail, which is uh, distributed statewide. And then there's also the narrowleaf cattail, which has moved in. Uh, it was an escaped water garden species from Europe and has moved into a lot of lake shores and drainage ditches and detention ponds and things like that. And also hybridized with our native cattail. So we have this hybrid, we have the narrowleaf, we have the broadleaf, and then we have a couple of other other water garden uh, introduction species that are moving in from the south. So we now have uh, five species that are present to some extent in the state. Um, all of our non-native cattails are very aggressive. They grow extremely dense and they often grow very tall. So 
when you have a plant that grows very densely, very tall, and has very high productivity, it's very difficult to compete with. So cattails can be very challenging to get anything established into. Um, one technique for managing them is to cut them underneath the water line. So where you have an emerging plant coming out of the water, you take a garden shears or something and you cut it down below the water level. And what you're trying to do is suffocate the root system of the plant. So you, um, the, the plant is using those stems to breathe atmospheric oxygen, basically. And if you can cut off all those straws that it's using, all those snorkels it's using, then you can starve out the root system and you can knock that colony back. So I wouldn't encourage people to plant a lot of things directly into cattails. Um, it's better to try to remove the cattails first. If you are trying to plant directly into the cattails, absolutely use potted plants, the biggest you can find, and choose plants that are fairly tall. So swamp milkweed or joe pieweed, things like that, maybe bone set. Those would be ones that might tolerate the cattail uh, encroachment because they're tall enough to still see the light. But if you try to put something that's only two or three feet tall into a cattail stand, it's gonna be shaded out so bad that uh, it's just not gonna thrive there. Pat, any other thoughts? No, it's a bugger. They're really, a, it's a tough situation. Um, you know, the, the few times I've been successful with it, we literally took a backhoe and just got the, literally dug the cattail out of there. But you need permits for that kind of thing. Yep. Okay, a couple of questions about rain gardens. One, um, asking about uh, planting rain gardens and establishing them in heavy clay soil. And another about, okay, they have a wet spot when it rains asking if a tree would work well, as well as a rain garden to absorb the extra water. All right, uh, the rain gardens in heavy clay, rain gardens really aren't, aren't a great option in heavy clay. If you don't have infiltration of at least about a, a half an inch to an inch per hour, uh, it's really not gonna work out all that well. It's gonna cause ponding for longer than you'd want. And if you get multiple heavy rains consecutively over like every couple of days, you get another big storm, you're just going to have a pond. It's just not going to drain very well. So you should do a, an infiltration test where you just dig a hole that's the size of a, a milk jug or something like that, a fairly small hole. It's maybe a foot deep and um, fill it all the way to the top with water and just stick a ruler in there come back every hour or two and check on it and, and calculate how many inches per hour that water is dropping through the soil. And again, if you're looking at a half an inch of, of infiltration or, or less than that per hour, then it's, it's really not suitable for a rain garden. And I would suggest just looking at using the clay buster type plants um, in that planting er and planting those in that area if that's a place where you wanna put some vegetation. Sure, so some things like compass plant or butterfly weed or um, things with these big tuberous root systems can kind of break up that clay and encourage a little bit more infiltration. So that could be an option. Yep, some grasses that can deal with clay soils, side oats, gam grandma, prairie brown grass, little blue, prairie drop seed, fox sedge, the sedge we mentioned earlier would work great. And then Catherine said she has a wet spot when it rains and she was asking if a tree would work as well as a rain garden to absorb the extra water. Yeah, I'm guessing that the wet spot is due to poor infiltration of the soil. So uh, if you're relying on the roots of the tree to absorb all the extra water, uh, it may not be all that effective if the water can't get down to the roots. So it might be best to do a rain garden or both. You could put a tree or a couple trees along the perimeter of the rain garden and then uh, create that depression as well. So you can immediately contain the water and then the trees might be able to, to soak up that water and transpire it faster than if you didn't have the trees there. You know, another plant that works great for that scenario is ferns, you know, big interrupted ferns there or other ferns that can handle wet feet. They do quite a bit of respiration too and um, might be another plant choice. Okay. Um, there was some questions about, I, it looks like Cindy has already left the chat, but um, I don't know if you want to just speak to if there's a 
stone seawall. Um, she was wondering if she could plant behind the stones or in the water. I, I don't think you can plant in the water unless you have a permit. Is that right, Patrick? Yeah, that's correct. You could do aquatic plantings in the water with a permit if if you wanted to put some, uh, you know, emergent plants if it's the right situation or or uh, lilies, for example, water, native water lilies, depending on the situation. But I would encourage there to do a, some kind of planting behind the stone structure towards the land if if um, if that's a possibility. Okay, some other comments here. Um, Valerie uh, also reminded folks of rain barrels. So did you want to talk a little bit about that, uh, Paul, with rain gardens? Yeah, so rain barrels are designed to catch typically about 40 to 50 gallons of water off of a downspout. Um, they're, as Valerie said, it's a good source of water for plantings. If you need to water your plants between rains and you've got this this large barrel of water, you can use that to water your plants. Uh, I would definitely encourage people, particularly if they have any water issues in their basements, to um, consider a fairly large overflow. So usually rain barrels are outfitted with a typical hose spigot for a half inch or a three quarter inch hose. And I found that to be horribly inadequate if you have good flow from a downspout. So instead of letting all that water just flow out and uh, splash down right next to your foundation, I would encourage you to, to put a, a two inch overflow on there, whether it's a plastic pipe or a PVC or whatever it is. But uh, I found that that never got overwhelmed in the case of our rain barrels at our old house, uh, having that two inch overflow. So um, yeah, I would encourage a two incher if, if you can, if you do use rain barrels. Okay. Um, I, I did receive a, a message from Sue asking about, um, it looks like she has pretty steep slopes um, with plantings on both sides of her boathouse along with a staircase to the water and it's difficult to weed the slopes and so she was wondering if there was any recommendation on how to terrace the slopes um, to ease management and is this a, a property that would qualify for any type of grant? Well, uh, it sounds like the scenario might be um, one that soil lifts. It's one of the erosion control techniques for dealing with sloped situations and trying to create a stair step. Um, and what they are are lifts of soil that have native vegetation in them and are stair stepped along the um, face of the slope. Um, Sometimes there is money through the counties. I mentioned the Department of Egg Trade and Consumer Protection, the county land and water conservation departments get conservation money to do these projects and shorelands are a part of that. Um, but no, this would not be eligible for healthy lakes, for example. Um, it's too big a project. Right. But I would encourage her to look at uh, plant lists that are talked about steep slopes or erosion control and then investigate on the Wisconsin Lakeshore Restoration uh, project portal on our extension webpage, um, the soil lift idea. Okay. Um, one person asked, um, uh, she said, I use cornmeal gluten to deter dandelions and feed my lawn. Would this be okay in the garden? I believe cornmeal gluten is a germination inhibitor that's a natural product uh, i don't know much about it so i guess i can't speak too much to that question that's about all i know i don't know if there's any toxicity that get, get, comes about with it building up in the soil or not i would look at the directions on the product to see um, what kind of coaching it gives you yeah i think it'd be fine as long as the garden has started with plugs because it's it's inhibiting germination of seeds and it typically those inhibitors don't have a, a much of an effect on established plants so if you're starting a new garden from seed you would not want to use that um, but i again i think it'd be fine with plugs okay and lynn just um had a comment here about the person who asked about cattails um she found that cutting the cattails on muck works pretty well um, and she replaced uh them with river bulrush yeah, that's a great one. And we use that in the Phragmites restoration site as well. We had an area of narrow leaf cattail that we were battling that was 
uh, on the edge of our project site and we planted a line of river bulrush about eight feet thick at the leading edge of the cattails to try to hold those back. And it did a fantastic job. It's, it's a native plant that's in the sedge family and it gets just as tall as the cattails do. So it did a fantastic job of holding the cattails back. And we talked a little bit about this and sometimes a, a permit is needed depending on, on what kind of rock is there. But Floyd wanted to know if um, you could replace rock with plants at the shore. Yeah, I was just typing something up into the chat form. Uh, native plantings often have the uh, ability to do a lot of the heavy work of stabilizing that shore area. Um, whether they can do all the work really depends on the amount of energy hitting that shore from the wind and wave from the lakeside as well as any overland flow that might be coming down slope. But that said, often uh, th that three tiers of vegetation we talked about, trees, a mid layer and a ground layer can do a, a lot of the work of stabilizing a, a shoreline um, if we uh, either leave it be or restore it. So yes would be the general answer to Floyd's question, but you might have to do some legwork on understanding the full energy of that site. Okay. A couple more questions. Um, does a rain garden fill up over time with sediment and plant decomposition materials? It will fill up to some extent, uh, depends on where your water is coming from. So if it's traveling over land, then it's probably gonna fill up faster from transporting eroded sediment down into the rain garden. Uh, in the case of a downspout, usually it's pretty clean. If it's from a metal roof, it's gonna be cleaner. Um, from an asphalt roof, you tend to have some little specks of asphalt shingles in the, the downspout area occasionally. Um, at our old house, I think at one point, I did scoop out maybe a coffee can worth of, of asphalt uh, particulates. Uh, our roof was getting kind of old at that house and I think that's part of the reason why we had a lot of that coming off. Um, other than that, the, the plants that are in the rain garden, if you don't remove any of the biomass, then yeah, eventually it'll, it'll slowly build up in there. But uh, rain gardens are pretty productive systems and so a lot of that organic material will be broken down and eventually uh, just be released as, as CO2 from the breakdown of those organic materials. So it would, the answer is probably yes, but it would be over a very long time period unless you're getting a lot of sediment flowing to the rain garden over land. Okay, I think one more question um, from Valerie. Uh, they have a large stand of cattail. Um, and then asked if if removal of that is possible via permitting and or can they have it burned or chemically treated? Yeah, cattails are, are difficult to work with. Uh, I think Valley and I have talked about this stand before. Um, it's with a large stand, you, you really can't use the cutting below water method. I mean, it would take you a very long time to get through those. So as far as burning, uh, I don't know much about treating cattails with burning, but since they are a very productive plant that spreads by rhizomes, uh, I think it probably would be pretty resistant to the burn. I think it would encourage better growth more than anything, uh, much like it does kind of rejuvenating a stand of prairie grasses. So I don't think burning would be a very good option. Um, as far as chemical treatment, yes, it certainly could be used. You could use the rodeo that uh, Patrick mentioned earlier, but this would require a permit to do it. And I would encourage you to probably work with a, a restoration consultant to handle that project. Okay, um, thanks for sticking with us. It looks like Amy Call um, also put an answer about clay soil question in the chat. So if you're interested in that, quick take a read. Um, but we will have this recording available by the end of the day. Anything else, Paul? I think that is it. Uh, we do have one more webinar coming up. Thanks again to Patrick and for Sarah and Amy for helping out today, keeping everything running smoothly. Next week's webinar, I did put the information into the chat before. It is on Wednesday the 13th. If you haven't registered for that yet, you can find the link to the registration page in the chat box earlier or look for it in the latest edition of the Citizen Lake Monitoring Network newsletter. Thanks everyone for joining and hopefully you can join us next week for the last webinar of the series.